booster 10 moving, star factory construction, an almost full stack at the launch site, and a whole bunch of regulatory news. We'll talk about that and more on today's episode 17 of Starbiz Flyover Update, brought to you by RGV Aerial Photography. Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Starbase Flyover Update. My name is Mauricio and today we'll be doing a flyover over Starbase, Texas. Hope you enjoy this flight. Here's a map layout of the areas of interest at Massey's test site. Shout out to Procky for creating these maps for each of the four sites. Diving right into Massey's, here's what it looked like last week on Thursday, September 7th. Now sliding over to the photo taken this week on Thursday, September 14th to compare the changes. Starting off our tour, the most noticeable change we see is that Booster 10 is now sitting atop the Booster Puck Shucker after its rollout from the Mega Bay last week on the evening of Saturday, September 10th, stretching to the morning of the 11th. So what is this for? It's likely that after the first round of testing last month, SpaceX wants to further certify the design of the E-Dome, or Elliptical Dome, which is a new stretch form dome design used in Booster 10 and above, as seen in this render from the Space Engineer. The booster, which is due to launch in IFT3 with either S26 or S28, underwent a cryogenic verification test on Friday. Here's an image from Anthony Gomez over at Rocket Ranch. Moving down to the ship puck shucker, we see that the trench dug last week by the pipework leading to the tank farm has been covered up. Rotating right to get a better view of the structural test cage, the umbrellas situated around the so-called nose cone gel have been removed, in a promising sign that upgrade work is near completion. We can eventually expect to see the payload bay test article S24.2 be tested inside, which will structurally verify the integrity of the pass dispenser door and pave the way for Starlink launches on Starship. On the right, we notice that the new steel has started to arrive since last week, where they'll be used for a brand new building whose purpose is currently unknown. What do you think it'll be used for? Flying past the hot staging test article and can crusher, where we saw no major changes this week. We arrive at these two newly erected tents which were placed onto the concrete base poured in previous weeks. On the very left of Massey's, we see some road expansion work going on, as seen by this freshly laid road base for connecting the Massey site to the rest of the civilization and for better access for cryogenic delivery tankers. In case you didn't know, all vehicles including the massive super heavy booster have to travel on this dusty road, which hasn't been paved yet. Our last area of interest here at Massey's is going to be the burst pad, which is where burst testing or overpressure testing as well as FTS testing is conducted. The ship aft simulator S26.1 has now been placed here and surrounded by these dirt blast berms, meaning we can expect S26.1 to be destroyed very shortly, maybe even by the time you're watching this video. You can also see that they have run new pipes through the berm and look likely to be connected to the GSE plumbing here. Say goodbye to Massey's as we head northeast to the Sanchez site. Welcome to the Sanchez site, which as usual has been bustling with fabrication work. Here's a map to help you with the identification of the different areas. Before getting started at Sanchez, here's a picture from the flyover we performed on Thursday, September 7th. Now sliding over to this picture from Thursday, September 14th to compare the changes. No updates for the ground fabrication building this week but we can see supplies for the next stand to be fabricated are being stationed here. The five legs previously located here have been moved near the others that were spotted last week. These pieces have also been moved to this location. As far as stand work is concerned, there really isn't much visible change this week with crews likely performing upfitting work on the interior of the structures. Next to the stands, we can see that the fabrication of the next work platform has begun which is anticipated to be like the one previously spotted inside Mega Bay 1 for the new booster engine installation stand. Right next to this, we can also see the new safety screen doors being fabricated, which are mounted around the base of the new stands to protect technicians using the work platform as well as those nearby. Above the stand construction area, we arrive at what has seemingly become another scrapyard. We can see the old booster adapter for use on the suborbital Starship stands is being scrapped. Also nearby is this unfamiliar stand. It's unknown exactly where this came from, but it reportedly came from inside a building somewhere in the area near Tent 3 at the build site. Based on the shape and features, it could be some form of nose cone jig. But regardless of its use, it appears it may be destined for scrapping now. Using this alternate angle from the north, we can also see what appears to be a new stand or addition for a stand being loaded onto a flatbed truck for transport. Where it is now, we're not certain, but we'll keep an eye out for it. 
What do you think it is? Let me know in the comment section down below. Adjacent to the air separation plant, we can see the pad prepared for concrete last week has been poured. Finally, we arrive at the Rocket Garden, where only the iconic duo Booster 4 and Ship 20 remains. Where's Booster 11, you might ask? In the early morning hours of September 12th, SPMTs arrived at the Sanchez site and were spotted being maneuvered under B-11 stand. Just a few hours later, B-11 made its way to the build site, where it would be lifted and placed onto a stand formerly occupied by Booster 10. We can see B-11 stand has been moved back to the garden following the move. That's all for Sanchez this week. Next up is a good old build site where we've seen quite a bit of Starship and factory construction this past week. Before we check out the progress, here's a picture from the flyover that occurred Thursday, September 7th, followed by a more current picture from Thursday, September 14th to compare the changes. If you want to play around with the slider yourself, we recently introduced this feature for our Patreon subscribers to compare all four sites at Starbase between this week's flyover and the last. Link to support us on Patreon is in the description down below. Starting off with a look at this angled shot of Mega Bay 2 under construction, we've seen work continue on the roof section where steel beams like the ones you've seen here on the bottom were lifted by the massive LR11000 crane to their respective positions on the roof. Staged near the steel beams are these larger steel beams, which are not destined for the roof, but rather they are bridge cranes spanning the width of Mega Bay 2. After the bridge cranes are installed into this gap in the roof beams, they'll be responsible for lifting booster segments on top of each other for stacking. Speaking of booster stacking, Booster 13 is still being stacked inside Mega Bay 1. This week we saw multiple sections of B13's LOX tank get moved into Mega Bay 1 and stacked. The most recent series of stacks make the booster 12 out of 24 rings tall. Next to the Mega Bay is the High Bay, home to ships 29, 30, and 31 the latter of which recently stacked onto its common dome on September 14th, the same day of the flyover. Two more sections remain until the ship is fully stacked. Next up, we switch to its top-down view to look at the former location of the mid-bay and tents 1 and 2. The foundations of these previous buildings have been totally dug up ahead of the Star Factory's expansion, leaving absolutely no trace of their existence. Panning up the image, we see the payload bay test article S24.2 being worked on ahead of testing at Massey's. And on the right, the original Star Factory expansion is nearing completion and is almost fully connected to the already completed section. The taller section of the Star Factory is progressing nicely as well, with additional vertical and horizontal steel beams being expanded further down to Highway 4. Near the entrance to the build site from Highway 4, we can see where one of the many anticipated bridge crane beams for Star Factory has arrived, as shown from our very own RGV camera. Moving on to this image, taken of Boca Chica Village, land continues to be cleared for the expansion of the town for SpaceX workers. And at the payload processing facility, we see a new concrete pour going on in the front with preparations for another pour on the right side. Conveniently located next to the payload facility is the S-22 nose cone, which has now been painted white. This nose code has been confirmed to be a crew mock-up. Make sure you subscribe for up-to-date news and analysis, and like this video so that it can reach a larger audience. And that'll do for the build site, let's head east to the launch site. At last, we arrive at the launch site, where the pavement meets the sand of Boca Chica Beach. Check out this map to familiarize yourself with the different areas around the site. Before getting started at the launch site, here is a picture from the flyover performed Thursday, September 7th. Now sliding over to this picture from Thursday, September 14th to compare the changes. Starting things off on the suborbital side, we can see crews are wrapping up the installation of the concrete perimeter wall on the north and the west sides. The formwork used to pour the wall can be seen here. There is a pretty substantial wall, one that will likely support a lot of dirt as crews work to bring the ground level closer to that of the tank farm nearby. Over in the area formerly used for staging of equipment and extra supplies, crews have dug trenches for possible future foundation work. Nothing can be seen lying inside the trenches yet, so we'll have to wait until the next flyover for more clues. Work continues on the inside of the bullet ship, S-26, in anticipation of a future spin prime and static fire campaign. No closures have been posted yet to signify any testing in the coming days. Moving over to the deluge tank farm, 
we can see the concrete slab that was being poured here last week has been finished up and what appears to be a parking lot has been created. Zooming in for a closer look, we can see labeled spots for equipment staging, civil staging, fleet, and bike. We'll see how well the organization pans out. If the ring yard at the build site is any indication, I don't have high hopes of this. Just to the right of this new slab, we can see prep work is underway for the area previously used for staging of the LR11000 crane during lifting operations for the new tanks. With this work being completed, crews were finally able to get to this next piece of the puzzle. Work continues on the third large storage tank. We can see the new high pressure gas supply and vent manifold has been installed on top this week. The lack of welding equipment in the area is a clue that the work underneath could be complete and we could be seeing the finishing touches being applied by the next flyover. Speaking of finishing touches, I captured a shot of these massive sacks of iron blasting a brave safe city next to the deluge farm at the edge of the pad. Labeled as a fine mixture, this would typically be used for light paint and rust removal prior to the new paint being applied or other fabrication work. Moving up to the orbital tank farm using this image from the north side, we can see crews have now connected the upper manifold to all the newly installed hippos at the liquid methane and liquid oxygen processing areas. These manifolds allow for the venting of gaseous nitrogen resulting from boil off inside the heat exchanger during the subcooling process. We can also see the fifth and final ox pump and motor have been installed as well. Still no plumbing to connect any of these new additions, but this isn't on the critical path to the second test flight. Now we move on to the launch pad. Where an interesting turn of events, we can see S25 has been destacked from Booster 9. In the early morning hours of the 14th, S25's transport stand was brought to the OLM, followed by the destacking later in the morning. The operation concluded just hours before this flyover. Check out this time lapse of the destack I captured with the RGB cam. So, why the destack? We'll touch on this later. Down near the edge of the pad, not far from the berm, we can see more concrete demolition work is underway. This is an odd location compared to the other work that's been happening around the OLM in the recent weeks. It's not clear why this is being torn up just yet. Moving to the south side of the OLM, we can see Fondag work underway yet again. This is perplexing to say the least at this point. The two locations seen here appear to be in the same location previously excavated and reported in the last few weeks. It's interesting that these cutouts appear to be directly above the feed pipes for the deluge manifold that connects to the steel plate. This could just be a coincidence. Before we finish out today's video, let's discuss why they may have destack S25. It turns out we might be a little further away from the second flight than we thought. According to this notice received by various members of the media on Friday and posted to X, the FAA will review new environmental information including changes related to the launch pad, as well as other proposed vehicle and flight modifications. This will also include collaboration with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. If it's determined that the contents of the 2022 Programmatic Environmental Assessment, or PEA, do not remain valid in light of the changes proposed for Flight 2, additional review will be required. Accordingly, the FAA has not authorized SpaceX's proposed Flight 2. A separate report came out on Wednesday, September 13th from Reuters, with details presented by the acting head of the FAA, Polly Trottenberg. She was quoted as saying, We're working well with them and have been in good discussions. Teams are working together and I think we're optimistic sometime next month. While this is not the news many fans were hoping for, it at least provides some insight into the ongoing approval process and why S25 may have been destacked. Crews likely want to perform some final checkouts across the board on the ship. The flight recorders will also need to be installed prior to the next launch, and most importantly, the flight termination system or FTS which will likely be the last item installed, coming after the FAA's approval notice and just prior to stacking for the final time. As frustrating as it is, we have to remember that the FAA is doing their job to ensure the safety of the public and the environment as well. This is the most powerful vehicle ever developed, after all. And so the wait continues. We'll wrap up today's video with this inspirational photo taken by SpaceX of all the hardworking employees working at Starbase. This group of incredibly talented individuals has overcome a lot of adversity in the past 5 months. Let's hope that hard work pays off for Flight 2. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Starbase Flyover Update. Today's video was sponsored by me. If you want to support our weekly flyovers, consider subscribing to our Patreon where you'll get access to our exclusive flyover gallery and other cool perks. 
If not, show your support by buying some RGV aerial photography merch. We got some really cool designs. Link is in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week.